Hey Internet, Caligula here and welcome to another video and to a brand new series! Today we're going to start playing A Case of Distrust, which is a noir style mystery game that takes place in, I believe, 1920 San Francisco. I think that this game came out in February and it caught my eye as soon as I saw it. It's been sitting in my Steam library for a while just because I haven't quite gotten around to playing it because I've been working on other things, but I'm super excited to start it today. So let's see if we can solve this mystery. Ooh. Yeah, the aesthetics of this game are just gorgeous. I love the art style. I awoke in my desk chair. Across from me were his piercing amber eyes. They surprised me at first, but I should have known he'd be there. Ooh. Who's got amber eyes? I stretched and said mid-yawn, not very nice to sneak into a sleeping woman's apartment, but his stare just continued. Ooh, who is this person staring at us? Is this a cat? I laughed at his glare. I'd seen San Francisco's shrewd thugs, hardened cops, and deadly politicians, but none could ever match that gaze. I knew I didn't have what he wanted. Reaching into my coat, I took out my knife and flicked it open. Holy shit! I gave him the knife, I held the knife steady. Uh, okay, I thought this was a cat, but why are we brandishing a knife at a cat? Let's give the cat, if it is a cat, let's give him the knife. I gave him the knife, sliding it across the desk. Look, I said, that's all there is, take it or leave it. But a detective knows when she's beat, and I knew then. He wanted to search the place, and that's what he would do. I sighed, knowing my weakness for his type. All right, I said. Let's look. It is a cat. Oh, I was right. He let out a gleeful meow in victory. I picked up the knife and cut a piece of my apple that the cat had rejected. Always the sore winner, I jabbed. But I was smiling too, because I was telling the truth. There was absolutely no other food in my apartment. Oh no, we're a starving detective. Ooh. The cat often dropped by to scavenge. He made a lot of noise when he thought I was holding out on him. But right now, the place was clean empty, no food anywhere. I had to prove it to him. Okay. Ooh, it looks like we can click on some stuff. So let's click on the cat. The cat had waltzed into my apartment a few years earlier. He kept coming back, though there was rarely a morsel to eat. He'd continue his loud meowing until I proved to him that the place was empty of food. Okay, so we have to prove that we've got no food. What's this? A book? My old notebook now filled to the brim. I wrote everything down, even the minor details. Never know what can be useful. The first half had my old cases, the second half had my current. Hmm. Let's find out about the current cases. The second half had my current bunk adultery cases. The only things I'd get hired to do. Aw, oh, adultery, how boring. Whatever my findings, my employers often refused to believe me. It was thankless work, but even that was hard to come by. All right, what else can we click on? What's this shit? A newspaper was flopped on the floor. It's headline about the death of Lenin, leader of the Red Menace sweeping Russia. It seemed the Bolsheviks had lost their head. All right. Is there a ref is this a refrigerator? The regular white ice box. Ooh, we found the ice box. Tinged yellow with age, half blocked the kitchen doorway. My income rarely kept much stocked in it, and right now it was empty. Okay, so how can we show the cat that it's empty? Let's look at the notes first. So the case summary. There were no cases just then, but the cat was mewing and needed attention. I had to contradict the cat by first talking to him, then pointing to a piece of evidence in my notebook that proved the apartment was empty of food. Oh, okay. So, so far we've gathered some evidence. The thing that we need is probably the ice box. So how do we show this to the cat? Maybe we click on the cat again. Oh, we can talk to him. It doesn't matter how doe-eyed you are, cutie pie. We've got no food around, I told him. He licked his chops and looked at me. Apparently, he still didn't believe me. I needed to contradict him somehow, to show him something in the apartment that would prove it was empty of food. Okay, I think we can contradict him with the icebox. Here we go. Use this to contradict. I opened the icebox so the cat could see inside. Empty, I told him. The cat looked quizzically at the open door, then back at me. Sorry, fella, there's no grub in there for me either. He stared at me with those eyes as disappointed as I felt. Those big yellows always got to my soul. Thoughts of my family filled my head. My sister, my parents, 
But never mind, my sister, my parents. Let's find out more about her parents. My parents were still in Chicago where they'd moved our family in the final year of schooling. I'd returned to California, but they maintained that there were better job prospects for my father in Chicago. Ooh, his alcoholism. Ooh, what about his new gigs? His new gigs were never permanent, odd jobs from his brother's contacts. He'd been a painter, a mover, a dock hand, and whatever other professions required cheap labor with few questions. But then a drunk rarely kept much work for long. My mother stuck by him, my sister refused. Ooh, my sister refused. My sister refused any financial aid until my father quit his addiction. Stubbornness and pride caused both sides much grief, and they were no longer on speaking terms. My parents were much worse for it, though. Most of their money came from my late grandmother's trust, but those funds were barely a trickle. I often dreamed of earning enough to help them. My mind spiraled into the usual series of questions. Had I even impacted the women's movement? Had I made any change on society at all? Was my plotting career worth losing traditional happiness? What was the point in the life I had chosen? You're a fucking female detective in the 1920s, lady. That's pretty fucking cool, and you got a cat friend. A loud meow from the cat snapped my thoughts back into the moment. I took a deep breath, then grinned back at him. Guess you can scram now, I said. Nobody's gonna come knocking with food for you, fella. Oh, bye cat friend. Oh shit. There immediately came a banging on the front door, beyond a nuisance this cat was psychic too. You order out, I asked him. Ooh, I don't like him already. I don't like this eyeless smirk. In the doorway was the regrettably familiar face of Connor Green. I stared at him, I looked past him. His company churned my stomach. Well, I feel like I don't really need to know more about why his company churned our stomach because that smirk of his churns my stomach too. Let's look past him. I looked past him, peering left and right into the hallway. I heard a woman's heels marching down the carpeted stairs, but otherwise the building was silent and empty. Evidently, Green had come alone. He stared at me through the doorway with a coy smile. Well, ain't you gonna invite me inside? <laughs> Let's start closing the door. <laughs> I started closing the door, but he stuck out a foot to stop me. Hey now, he chided. Foul way to treat a customer, Malone. Oh, her last name's Malone. So that was his angle, hiring me as a detective. I wondered what a bootlegger would need with a private eye, but he answered without my prompt. I don't know what a bootlegger is. I'll make this quick. I can't take this to the hog house or the pigs would laugh me out. And other dicks just aren't as tempting. Ooh. Jeez, man. His grin widened. Thought this was gonna be quick, I said, and I started rolling a cigarette. It wasn't quick, and I'd already rolled and lighted a second smoke when Green finally finished his story. I noted the important bits in my book. All right. It had started with a letter slipped under his door in a white envelope. The envelope contained a single typewritten leaf, which he handed to me. It read, end your game or we'll end you. It had no signature, instead ending with only a small scribble in the bottom right corner that resembled a black hand. Green had a lead on the new rum running scheme, a connection from Vancouver. He'd given a sample to Tiny Paul. <laughs> Tiny Paul? The gangster who ran the Tin Spoon Speakeasy for mob boss Jerry Ferry. <laughs> Jerry Ferry. <laughs> oh, to live in the 1920s when everybody had rhyming names. They'd agreed to buy in for more. Green surmised the letter was about his rum running. Okay, so this is during Prohibition. I'm guessing, I don't remember exactly when Prohibition was. Apparently, this guy's got some sort of rum run business that he's got to keep under the nose of, of the law. He suspected Redstone Stable, another bootlegger, of sending the letter. He told me that a stable ran a barber shop during the day and gave me the address. Hmm, I wonder why he suspects that man. Green needed to know who the threat was from. He'd get Paul's gang to deal with them and continue his scheme to get rich. If I go snooping myself, he concluded, folks see I'm not trusting people. No trust leads to no customers. I need to play it low key, which is where you come in. I raised an eyebrow and stared at him through the cigarette smoke. Something in his yarn was still twisted. He must have noticed my reticence because he said, You know, I work closely with Lewis. I'm sure he'd want to protect me as much as any other victim. Who's Lewis? My uncle. Lewis had put me on the force. I'd finally accepted Lewis's death. 
I was still searching for answers. Hmm. I'd finally accepted his death. I want to know about his death. He was the only officer who'd let me walk the beats or do more at crime scenes than comfort a widow. He'd been obsessed with helping victims and bringing justice to those beyond salvation. I'd quit the SFPD and started my own practice, taking his ethos to heart. Was Green worth my time? Would he be worth Lewis's? Mm. Green had tipped off my uncle in a few cases. I wondered if that was enough to warrant my protection. Before I could think past my headache, he threw a bill in my lap. Keep the C note as a retainer. And don't worry about getting in touch. I'll find you later for a chat. He turned down the hallway and I let him go. If he was willing to give me a hundred bucks with no commitment, I wouldn't stop him. But I want to know how our uncle died. Oh well. I turned back to the apartment, still confused about the whole story. My headache wasn't helping either. Whenever I lacked clarity, a trip to Southern Coffee was usually the cure. Let's keep clicking before we leave. That lamp had belonged to my Uncle Lewis. He'd been an SFPD officer, one who argued police women could be good detectives, even while the others jeered at me. I knew he'd been right, but my current workload didn't help that claim. I thought about Lewis more often than I wanted. I was lousy at handling the emotions behind those thoughts. Well, that didn't reveal much information. Ooh, what's this shit? I'd taken copies of old murder cases from the SFPD. PD re records when I'd left. I loved reading through them, even though my own contributions were minimal. At that time, I longed for those types of jobs. The truth was, any work was hard to find for a female detective. Ooh, what's this birdie? I kept a small statue underneath the side table. It had been police evidence in a crime, and its owner hadn't wanted it back. I took a shine to it, so I snagged it for myself on my way out of the department. Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> not the really an ethical thing for a detective to do, but all right, looks like we can't click on anything else, so let's get out of here. There was only one place I needed to go to clear my head. Southern Coffee was a basement dive. It wasn't modern, hip, or ever busy, and it was my favorite place to lay down some paint, especially in the company of the best bartender in the city. Oh, Southern Coffee is a bar, right, because it's prohibition. I get it, I get it. I gave my address and slouched in the back seat of the taxi cab. I thought a good way to pass the journey might be to chat with the driver. Uh, all right, we'll talk to him. I asked him about his shift and how much longer he'd be driving. Not all my conversations with cab drivers were memorable. Oh, well yeah, that was a pretty boring conversation. Southern Coffee was an automat diner. Ethel Burgess, the lone waitress, was friendly to help with any inquiry. Of course, if you winked at her right, she'd show you the way to the downstairs toilet where Frankie played bathroom attendant. Bathroom attendant. Oh, this is the toilet, I see. Southern Coffee had the distinct feeling of home. The familiar smell of mold in that old basement was enough to put a grin on my face. All right, Ooh, what's this? I grabbed the wine bottle on the bar and examined its label. It featured a picture of grapes in the word sacramental use only. <laughs> Frankie looked at me with a spark in his eye. Go ahead, he said, and give it a swig. Hell yeah, let's drink it! I grabbed the half-empty glass that had been next to the bottle and swirled some of its contents between my gums. A bit spicy, ain't it? Frankie asked. It's good, I nodded. I shook my head too much. Probably all booze is good when you can't have any booze. It's good, I nodded and gulped the rest down. It'll cost you too, he said with a smile, and he grabbed the bottle from me, turning it through his hands. Rabbis charge more than a nickel for this beauty. Only this type of Napa wine is made from that Zinfandel grape. It has a unique aroma. I'd been trying to learn more about wine. It seemed everyone knew their stuff but me. I noted what Frankie had said about the origin of the grape as he set the bottle back down on the bar. You don't even drink since when do you know grapes? Oh, we got a bartender who doesn't drink? You don't even drink, I chided. Frankie let out a bellied laugh. I can still enjoy the smell, he said. There was a story behind his teetotaling, but he'd cut short any talk about it. An odd relationship with the drink for a barman. Frankie sighed. Too bad more folks can't know about it. That women's league is the devil. The Women's Christian Temperance Union was now under feminist Frances Willard, a positive force for the suffrage of women, but her staunch support of prohibition, along with the union's massive political clout, irked the very wet San Franciscan public, and she particularly wasn't popular with bartenders. I imagine not. Take a seat, he said. I'll make you something else. He was a big fella. He'd been a decent pitcher. He was a fantastic orator. Oh, Frankie, you play baseball? He'd been a decent pitcher for the Seals a few decades earlier. Sometimes he'd speak wistfully of those days, but his arms were much more used to slinging bottles now. I sat at the bar. 
You got the spooks PC, he asked. You look worn as a catcher's mitt. I suppose my exhaustion showed. I want a hundred bucks for nothing and I can't let it go. I told Frankie about the case. Why are we telling a bartender about <laughs> the case that someone hired us to solve. I told Frankie about the case, the threatening letter sent to Connor Green, how he assumed it was related to his bootlegging, and his suspicion of Redstone Stable. The story took longer than I'd wanted, Frankie showing genuine interest by asking many questions. Oh, you're such a good listener, Frankie. When I finished, he threw me the whiskey, sour he'd been stirring. I took a large gulp and gave a sigh as thanks. Well, Green's case is better than most of what you're given, he said with some enthusiasm. At least it's not more of that adultery bunk? Sure, I replied, but I started with a goal in mind. What's the point in helping a man like Green? Frankie clicked his tongue on his teeth. Lawyer or priest, why does it matter? Let me ask you, are the clients you have now the types you want to help? I admitted they weren't. I refuse to admit <laughs> people who seek out adulterers, they seem really boring. I admitted they weren't. I told him that I'd wanted more from my detecting life. It could be that Green's case shoots your career forward, Malone. I sighed and stared down at my drink. Frankie seems like a wise man. But my daze was interrupted by the basement door opening, then slamming shut. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. Back off, lady. A small, blustering woman began marching towards me. She looked younger than she was wearing a, a bucket hat. She was wearing a black blue cloche hat, a scarf of similar blue draped around her neck. But I was startled by what she wore under it, a gray trench coat that looked too large for her frame. It was exactly like the one that had belonged to... Lewis? What's this lady doing wearing our uncle's coat? Our dead uncle's coat? She hurled insults at me a while. All I could do was sit and take it until she ran out of gas and started breathing heavily. I sat my drink on the bar and looked her in the eyes. I inserted a hello. <laughs> I studied her features. I turned away. <laughs> Let's say hello. I inserted a, hello, I'm Phyllis Malone. Oh, Phyllis, that's our name. How can I help you? Accompanied by a smile as genuine as I could muster. That knocked her off balance. She stumbled over her next few words and I added, and you are? The flame returned to her eyes. Between clenched teeth, she hissed, I'm the wife of that bum who sneaks into your bed. I asked the cat. <laughs> that's probably not the wisest thing to say. where do you get that coat? I just gaped. Uh, let's just ask her where she got the coat. Where do you get the coat? I asked her. What? She said, confused. I don't know. My husband gave it to me. Look, don't change the subject, you floozy. I saw him leaving your sty this morning. And that was when I gathered she was Connor Green's wife. Huh. This is Connor Green's wife, and Connor Green, who has just hired us, apparently gave his wife our uncle's coat. Is this the mystery of our uncle's coat? Is that what this really is? Mrs. Green, I'm a PI, not a home wrecker. And I don't think your husband in his line of business would want to bed a dick anyhow. Oh, dick must mean cop. Oh. <laughs> I was a little thrown off by this 20 slang. Her look was pure incredulity. A woman in that line of work, she questioned. I don't believe it. Do we even have anything that we could prove it with? We could try. What's our, what's our evidence that we've got? Paper stack. Desk lamp, statue, newspaper, notebook, icebox, greens, letter. We probably can't use the cash register to prove that we're a private investigator. Do we have the paper stack? I'd taken copies of old murder cases from the SFPD records when I'd left. I loved reading through them, even though my own contributions were minimal. That could work. Let's show her the stack of papers that we're apparently carrying around in our pocket. Mrs. Green, at home I have a giant stack of cases, each one from a separate crime covering many of the cities across the country. I went into great detail on a few of the logs, especially some of the more famous capers. I studied them because that's my job. It still took more coaxing for her to believe me, but eventually she came around. She seemed grateful I'd explained it to her. Apparently, she had seen her husband leave my apartment and, distraught, she had followed me all the way to Frankie's basement and decided to confront me. So she was following her husband anyway? Hmm. I suppose I lost my head after what I thought I'd seen, she said, and she began to cry. Oh, we didn't mean to make you cry, lady. Frankie, ever chivalrous to a dimpled girl, came around the bar and held her up. Now that's all right, Mrs. Green. Why don't I hail you a cab and send you on back home? She agreed and they walked together up the stairs. 
When Frankie returned, I said to him, You turn night real quick. He snorted a laugh. Ah, hell, we can't have that siren in here. With the torture yelling like that, every street bugger would come to her rescue. Mrs. Green is a torch singer? What's a torch singer? Well, I learned that she was Mrs. Connor Green just now when she came in here. I'd only seen her as Lil Fanny singing lead for the jazz band at the Tin Spoon. The Tin Spoon, I said. Tiny Paul's joint? That's where Green is selling his liquor. Say, you think that's where she met her husband? I laughed. You're a real sleuth, Frankie. He made a sarcastic bow. I shook my head. You're telling me you escorted our little torture out just to avoid a bit of hot water? Frankie flushed and said, What are you talking about, Malone? Oh, Frankie's got a crush. I was never good with emotions, but it was plain that Frankie had instantly fallen for that girl. Frankie, she's a married woman, Frankie. So what if I had more to squeeze out of her? I asked. What more could you possibly want from little Fanny? She can't have anything to do with Green's mess. Hmm. Do we have anything that we could contradict him with? We probably don't. I don't think we do. I consider Frankie's point. Maybe she was unrelated to the case. I shrugged and stood up from the bar stool. What had just happened was quite the ruckus. It seemed it was my cue to move along. Oh, Frankie was still behind the bar. If I was stuck on the case, a long drink with him might be helpful. Okay, so we could talk to him later if we want. Yeah, let's go ahead and leave and just see what we can do. Can we go anywhere else? I was heading up the stairs when Frankie called after me. So what are you gonna do? I'd been thinking about little Fanny about my parents. <laughs> it seems kind of random to bring up our parents. I'd been thinking about little Fanny. Such a funny name. I supposed even mobsters had people who cared about them, and she'd been wearing Louis's Lewis old jacket, so perhaps Green and Louis had been closer than I'd realize. I guess I'll take Connor Green's bait, I replied. I've got nothing better on the stove, and he might need the help. Something still stinks, though. Well, what's your plan? Frankie asked. The way I see it, I have three goals right now. Green hired me for a job, so first we've got to find the guy that wrote the letter. That's the basic part. But you want more? Asked Frankie. It seems weird that we're telling Frankie everything about this case, but okay. I nodded. Green's a shady character. I have to learn about him. Who is this guy? Dig into his past. I can't go back to him blind. And then there's something about his bootlegging. How'd Green get a connection like that? What's his source exactly? Squeezing that lemon might give me more juice. That sounds all right, he replied. So where is it you're off to? I've got three leads. That bootlegger stable, who Green claims sent him the letter. The Tin Spoon Lounge, where I might learn more about Green's rum running schemes. And Mrs. Green, who could give me more dirt on her husband. Frankie nodded his approval. Well, if you're ever stuck, come back and see me. You can never solve anything without thinking it over. I smiled and went up the stairs. Ooh, so where should we go next? We just came from Southern Coffee. Should we go to Stable's Barbershop, the Tin Spoon Lounge, or Green's house? Hmm. I kind of want to talk to that lady more, so let's go to Green's house first. Green's house might contain more clues about his past, or some reason a threatening letter would come his way. And if I got lucky, Mrs. Green would be there to pump with more questions. Yeah, let's go there. The Green's apartment was a section of an old Western edition mansion. The owners had divided it for struggling families to rent after the 1906 fire. Once downtown had been rebuilt, people of means moved out of the area. Recent immigrants, mainly from Japan, rented most of the apartments in this part of town. Okay, so they don't have much money, the Greens, actually. I knocked on the front door but didn't get a response. The latch was undone, so I pushed it open and stepped into the room. The apartment had a dense cloud, the room reeked of laudanum. Isn't laudanum? Laudanum opium? The room reeked of laudanum. Based on the smell, I imagine she'd had enough opium to knock out a horse. It is opium. Uh, okay, maybe we should try to wake her up. I found Mrs. Green slumped in her chair, eyes closed, head rocking slowly. Oh no, Mrs. Green, you really did a number on yourself right after you left the bar. Hello, Mrs. Green, I said loudly. She let out a long moan from the chair, then lifted her head but failed to raise her eyelids. She tilted her head to the side, giggled, then let it loll back into place. Oh, well, that's not very good. I shook her lightly and she moaned again but said nothing more. Ooh, that's not a good sign, but okay. What's this? This bottle. Empty bottles were strewn around the apartment. I brought one to my nose and smelled the distinct aroma of laudanum, opium mixed with booze, a harsh tonic. Dang, Mrs. Green! Maybe you should chill out. Well, while well, she's passed out, let's keep snooping. A wilting plant was on the furthest table from the door. I could never keep plants alive either. 
Even as the petals fell, they were still a vibrant color. Uh, okay, so I guess she doesn't water her plants very often. What can we click on? What's this? I opened the drawer of the backmost table, and it were two train tickets. I mumbled St. Louis to myself, but then came the cackling voice of Mrs. Green. Ha, ah, forget about moving, Connor. I won't budge. Her head was raised, but her eyelids still remained closed. Huh. I asked her further questions, but her head just lolled back to where it had been. There was nothing else she'd say. St. Louis. Tickets to St. Louis. Is this guy planning on leaving town? Suspicious. Bottles on the top of the round table were mostly empty. Ooh. Oh, it's the trench coat. The gray trench coat was hanging in the doorway. It certainly looked identical to Lewis's. I searched the pockets and found no identifying marks. It might have been a different jacket, but its recent appearance was off-putting. All right, is there anything else we could click on in here? I mean, maybe we should try to wake this lady up one more time. Or at least roll her on her side or something. Guess we can't. Well, thanks for letting us snoop around your apartment, lady. Goodbye.